Hello, my friends. Um, I just got back from work, and uh, for some reason I decided to put on this hat. It was laying around. My ex-wife gave me this hat. I think she thought it was kind of like a, you know, like a, like a gangster kind of fucking. You know what I mean? Look at my hair. This this kind of. I don't know. But anyway, for a while I wore it. I embraced it. I, I don't think I'd wear it much now, but but I, I thought it appropriate because you know when I have a hat to doff, pay respects to James Con. So James Con just passed away at eighty two, I believe. So I'm not the world's biggest James Con fan. I mean, I like him. I always think he's good in interviews. He's, he seems like an earthy guy, seemed like an earthy guy, and he brought that to his to his movie roles. Um, the first movie where I really fell in love with James Conn was one of The Godfather and stuff like that that I'd already seen him in, but it was uh, Sam Peckinpah's The Killer Elite, and I really think that was an interesting movie. The first half of the movie has this really interesting structure uh, where Khan is sold out uh, by his friend and he's shot like in the leg at a couple places. So he's got to go through all this physical therapy. And rather than go into just the, you know, revenge part or what, what is he going to do? Because he's kind of like a mercenary, you know, whatever. Uh, instead of focuses like on his physical therapy and like his his feelings, his emotions, uh, it's very weird. It's a very weird <laughs> uh, path to pursue in the middle of a, a basically what was one of Peckinpah's more, I guess, commercial uh, action films. Uh, it's got like Gig Young and Bert Young and Mako and. Uh, Obviously, I can't remember uh, Khan's uh, opposite number. It was some, some, some very major actor. I haven't seen it in a long time. Of course, like everything else of value from the golden age of cinema, Hollywood cinema, it's been remade. I think there's even like maybe a video game of it. But I'm like, why, why would you make such an idiosyncratic movie? I mean, the movie kind of falls apart in the last one because they last act because they start cramming all this um, martial arts and samurai swords and then you know every different kind of like sniper and explosions and falling off bridges and because he had you know assembles this like ragtag team of mercenaries to, to, to bounce back and ultimately get his revenge um the path to his revenge the path to assembling his a team <laughs> uh, is really compelling. Uh, the actual assemblage, I don't know. I mean, I'm a sucker for that kind of thing, but it can be done really well. For instance, in a genre movie like Today We Kill, Tomorrow We Die, is that the, yeah. Uh, written by Dario Argento, uh, where you got this cat played by Brett Halsey. And he plays this gunfighter named Bill Kiowa. And Bill Kiowa assembles this group uh, of people with his father's help. Very low key. There's hardly any music on the soundtrack. Uh, Halsey's very understated. The dubbing for him under the uh, pseudonym Montgomery Ford is very well done. It's... Uh, it's weird, and he assembles like this group of Bud Spencer being like I guess the most well-known actor among the bunch. He was huge then, and that movie was marketed as a Bud Spencer movie. It's really a Brad Halsey movie or Montgomery Ford. I intend to do today. We kill tomorrow. We die in Extreme Forgotten sometime before summer's over. I've never done a spaghetti full spaghetti western review on this channel. Amazingly. Uh, but my point is, like, they, he assembles the guys, and he goes and talks to them, and then you see them, first you see Bill Kiowa riding with, like, 
one of the guys and this kind of uh, canned Hollywood Western music. Da, 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 da. And then as he assembles each one, they show him writing with that music for a few seconds. And it's like so cheesy. But it's a it's a great movie, and and the villain is played by Tatsuya Nakadai. I mean, I, you you know you this this you couldn't make up a dream movie like this. Uh, my point is the assemblage of his 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 group, his A team. Uh, I liked the way it was done. Um, I liked the way he, he encountered each one, and and of course this has been used constantly. You know, I mean. In a way, the Avengers movie, Nick Fury did the same thing. And I don't think that was done in a very compelling way, to be frank. The, not the Black Widow approaching Hulk. It, I, it didn't have that gravitas. Uh, the Avengers was a movie that uh, that I don't like. Uh, but it's a movie that needed to exist. It needed to crack. Um through the, the, the viability of the superhero team on screen uh, from a commercial viewpoint. From another viewpoint, story-wise, it needed to get that out of the way, how the Avengers form. Then we could get on with, this is their world, this is their Avenger, uh, this is the Avengers world, this is their lives, and this is how, this is the ramifications and repercussions of their superhuman fallout so the killer elite is a, is in that lineage uh and i mean he doesn't go and like ominously talk to each person uh i tell you how where it's done bad with superheroes is justice league uh really bad uh ben affleck is yeah he, he he's not nick fury sam jackson he's he, he, he ain't Bill Kyle or Brett Halsey. Um, he, he's nothing. I mean, he's to me, eh. But, so that was my James Caan experience. And I, I kind of liked him. I thought he had a humane quality. Uh, kind of tough, but sensitive underneath. So, I can't remember when I first saw Thief. I can't remember if I had rented it. But I'm pretty sure. No, I wasn't renting movies then. Maybe I streamed it. I could have just bought the DVD. It blind. I wish I could remember, but I did watch it after I'd seen The Killer. So what I want to do today, I don't know for how long. Uh, is talk about James Caan and Thief. Uh, to me, me personally, because that's, that's all I got, man. That's me. It's me. You know, I'm here to share me with you. If you don't like me or dig me, then you probably won't be watching or you'll be hate watching. Hate watching is cool because I get views. You know? um, I get thumbs down, but I don't see them anymore. It's weird. Uh, so yeah, my connection with James Caan, this is going to be my, uh, <laughs> requiem for Caan. <laughs> Sounds like a Star Trek <laughs> sequel, Requiem for Caan, and Kirk's up there, nice back. Um, Thief to me is an extraordinary film. Uh, it came out in 1981. Uh, Michael Mann uh, had a reputation as a I guess, music video uh, and documentary uh, and advertisements maker, a maker of those things. Uh, slick, uh, well done, tight. Ridley Scott came from that background as well. And of course, Ridley Scott also had a very strong visual arts background. Uh, when I eventually, I don't know when, but when I eventually talk about uh, my favorite Ridley Scott film, I'll go into that stuff. Um, 
In this case, Michael Mann, you know, I knew who he was in the 80s with Miami Vice. I knew his name. I knew he created the show. He directed the first episode. He wrote it. And it was kind of style over substance. But it was a lot of style. And it was it was the 80s. And I keep remembering it. I was Bill Collins, something in the air tonight. Uh, and they used all kinds of music. Music was a big part of the mystique of the show and the selection of the music. I mean, uh, the guy I knew, Mark Baranowski, a.k.a. The Marksman. You can find my exclusive 20-year-old interview with him on my channel. Check it out, please. It's, it's fascinating and kind of absurd. Um, he compiled, like, these tapes. He was a big Miami Vice, Michael Mann fan. And he compiled these tapes of, like, every song that was used in Miami Vice. He kind of wanted a sonic wallpaper of this. So it was a fun project to, to track down. But, I mean, they went deep. Michael Mann went deep. I mean, he had a Fields of the Nephilim song on there. I, remember, I don't remember which one. But that alone, you know, uh, other than... Richard Stanley's Hardware, where Carl McCoy, lead singer of Fields of the Nephilim, actually appears as an actor briefly in the beginning in his post-apocalyptic cowboy garb. Uh, aside from his music being used there, uh, I can't think of a, a more commercial place for it to be used. I mean, many more people, I'm sure, saw that Miami Vice episode than, than maybe has ever have ever seen hardware. I saw hardware in the theater. It's just, it was weird. It was an outlier. But it was science fiction. Uh, and I had no idea one day I'd, I'd meet Richard and be friends with Richard. But I've reviewed Colored Out of Space. I've talked a lot about Richard before. So best not to linger there. Let's get back to Michael Mann. So Michael Mann directed and produced and wrote his first feature film in 1981, Thief. So Thief, I have a few cheat notes because a few things I don't know, you know, that aren't in my head, you know, at all times, believe it or not. No, um, so let's talk about what Thief was, you know, uh, conceived as. So Wikipedia describes it as an American neo-noir heist action thriller film directed and written by Michael Mann in his feature film debut. Based on the 1975 novel The Home Invaders, colon, Confessions of a Cat Burglar by Frank Homer, the film stars James Caan in the title role, a professional safecracker trying to escape his life of crime and choose their world as his wife. The supporting cast includes James Belushi, Robert Prosky, Dennis Farina, and Willie Nelson. The music was performed, composed by Tangerine Dream. And it is quite amazing. Um, so that's kind of really the background, you know, is that... Uh, He'd been working in television drama. Uh, he'd been working in advertisements. And, uh, you know, many of these kind of hallmarks of his style began with Thief. I mean, began before Thief. But with Thief, he was able to paint them on a vaster canvas. And what's interesting, and when I say vaster, I mean, we're talking about a movie that Jerry Bruckheimer of produce of all of all fucking people, um, uh, and James Caan, you know, he he thought the role was kind of difficult, um, and it was, but but he nailed it. I mean, so let's talk about the story. So basically, like Frank, I don't think they even get his last name anywhere in the movie, and it's. It's of no import. Um, Frank is indeed a safe cracker. He, crack, he, he breaks into people's houses and mansions. He, he breaks into uh, you know, industrial places. Uh, you know, uh, um, 
anywhere where there might be a safe <laughs> that he can crack. Um, and he's got a lot of equipment. He knows his shit. Heists are his life. And as he describes, as the movie goes on, you, you, you start to see pieces of his origin story. And he's like, I was, I was in the system since I was a kid. He was like an orphan. You know, he was like, yeah, in the system, he kept getting arrested. Probably beaten up and raped. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm just... I'm just telling it like it is, okay? And learn to take care of himself and to how to take care of himself in a heartbeat. Like he can go from, hey man, I'm Frank, to you're dead. And, you know, there's a scene like that early in the movie where he just basically tells the guy, you will not fuck with me. And it's hard to describe the connection I feel with this character, Frank. But that's kind of why I made this video because Khan died and Khan has gone on record saying that there's a eight minute scene in Thief that is his personal favorite work of his own. Difficult, powerful, uh, taxing emotionally, but that he delivered the goods. And he did. And I'll get to that scene because it's my favorite scene in the movie. Uh, and it's one of my favorite scenes in any movie. It actually is something that I carry in my head, uh, my, in my own beliefs about love and not being alone and planning a life and, and finding someone to fill that, that slot. Um, I'll get to that. So Frank was in the system and Went to prison a few times. In prison, he became friends with this guy named Oki. I think his name's Oki. I'm not. I'm gonna fuck this up. He's got a crazy name. Maybe it's Ola. David Bertino, Okla. Maybe short for Oklahoma. Okla is played by Willie Nelson, and he's the closest to family. Frank has, and he is serving a, a life sentence in prison, and he is going to die in prison. And he finds out he has cancer. He wants to not die in prison if possible. Now, on the side of all this, as Frank is kind of saving his money, he's got a used car uh, dealership that's like the front for what he's doing. And, and he's just, he's got this um, implacable, you know, uh, personality veneer where, you know, he's like, I, I own a car sale, you know, I have a car dealership. I don't do anything else. You know, and, you know, the cops fuck with Frank and Frank talks shit to them. A lot of people want to kill him because, really just because he's, he wants to make his money on his own terms. Now, of course, he's making it in a, you know, way that's frowned upon by most of society, but he wants to make the money and he wants to be free of the, the life. He wants to find that special woman and retire. It reminds me a lot of Ron O'Neill in Superfly, um, which is, you know, in my top five favorite films ever. I haven't reviewed it for this channel one day. Uh, it's basically like here's the system and there's like the legit system which in this case of a Frank would be uh, you know the foster homes the prisons the people who are punishing him for being a criminal trying to turn him around trying to help him ostensibly um, and then there's the uh, then there's the other side you know the people who want to hook him and keep him in the life because they see him as a talent in this area. It's a lot like Priest in uh, Young Blood Priest, the character Ron O'Neill plays in Superfly. Um, so it's all the establishment, whether it's the quote unquote good guys, you know, that make the rules or whether it's you know, the bad guys who are like, you're one of us, do what we say. 
and, and Priest is like, and Superfly Priest is like, you know, uh, his woman at Georgia asks him, you know, what does he really want, Priest? And he says, not to have to be forced into a thing just because that's the way it is. Just to be free. I hope you read the subtitles. And I feel like that journey is what's informing Frank and Thief. I almost feel like Thief is like super fly to the next power. I mean, I know it's weird comparing these movies. It's the first time I ever thought of it, right here in front of you, spontaneously live. But, yeah, uh, this is kind of sometimes how I think sometimes. You know, I have a whole philosophy behind the way I interpret uh, certain stories and characters. Maybe that's because I write my own stories and characters. Uh, but it's important to me, and... Um, at one point, my ex-fiance said early on in our relationship, you know, I told her I'd like to record some videos, maybe some movie reviews. And she's like, I always wanted to maybe have a show, like two people, and they talk about movies on a different level, like the structure of the movie, like the spiritual, psychological, philosophical level. Um, my ex-fiance abandoned me three years ago, as you all know. Uh, but I'm doing that show, man. I, I don't need you with me. I'm, I didn't steal your idea because I had had that idea anyway. And that was the beauty of us was that we brought to each other, uh, mirrors of each other's souls. And, uh, it would have been the greatest partnership in my life. I'm sure on every level, the artistic being one of them as I'm citing. But I, you know, I know I, I, to her, I say, I don't need you. I'm doing the show. I'm moving forward. You do your thing. You know, we live kind of parallel lives, at least last I heard. I don't know what she's up to, and I, I, it's not my business. So my thing is, though, her words, off, her words often crystallized what I was already thinking famously about Flickr Street, my story. But about that too, about the idea of that kind of show. It took a while for this show to grow into that kind of show. There would be intermittent episodes, and sometimes I would have people that would really get it. Like, I'll tell you a person I know, Jupiter Huxley. Uh, she's a friend of mine on Facebook, and she has a wonderful husband, David Sextian. Uh, and they're a very creative... Uh, outside of the norm, off the grid, practically uh, mystical, cosmic, philosophical, you know, artistic, just they're a power couple, man. And the love they have is so profound, you know, and what they do is they, they create from that love. And that's, that's what I wanted with Kelly. I'll say her. Uh, but Jupiter said to me, she watched one of my earlier, I don't remember the movie, but I was kind of waxing philosophical like this. And she said, you know, that I dug deep into this. And she said, this is why I watch Blue Review. Thank you. You know, keep up the good work, brother. And I was like, wow, okay, so she gets it. And she commented in one of my recent videos, uh, the last one, I think, Out of the Blue. I really appreciate all my followers and watchers and audience uh, a lot. So I want to I want this to be a quality video. Obviously, it's meandering and it's going to be long, but I want it to be real. I don't want to be meandering. Just uh, here's a trivia bit. Let me go on and on about that for a while. Uh, I I want you know I want to do the Bruce Lee thing. You need emotional content. And that's what a lot of fandom is lacking. Uh, fandom and commentators uh, in all areas, even ones about politics, they 
there's a shallowness to a lot of it and uh, an attention seeking uh, money grubbing aspect to it you know i mean isn't that what a lot of tiktok seems to be i mean i don't know if those people are making money but that, that seems to be what a lot of it is it's just, this is my five 15 minutes of fame or my five minutes of fame i'm on tiktok by the way but i haven't made any videos i have sketched out some and <laughs> they won't go over well but i'll be really amused by them if i can pull them off um So what we need is really more real. You know, we don't need just a dry recitation of facts. Uh, and, and I have friends who are very good at that, that they're hyper-focused. Uh, I love them, but I wish sometimes they would break out of that and get down to the root. Like, what do you really feel about this piece of art? You know, don't don't recite something you heard or you uh, think someone wants to hear, or a review. You know, paraphrasing a a a, a review like rock journalism review or film journalism review, using like uh, all those tropes, including the word tropes, uh, come from here, man. That, that's that's what I think is something I'd like some of my friends to be able to do who I know have the potential to do it. But they're not necessarily on this exact path, but I value their, their patronage and their support. So let's get the emotional content going. <laughs> um, Frank has this thing going, like I said, the cops hate him. He's brilliant at what he does. He's got a lot of money socked away. He has his car dealership front. His friend Okla, he's trying to get out of prison so he doesn't die there. And on the side, he's got this woman, uh, but she's a weld. Um, and uh, her name is Jesse. Again, like Frank, we don't really get a lot of these characters' full names. The only reason we get Oakless' full legal name is because he's called out in court when they actually do let him go. And he, he dies shortly after. Um, but Jesse is somebody that uh, her, her and Frank feel like they're attracted to each other and they're sort of casually dating, but... She just thinks he's, uh, as Nick Cruz would say, deeply unserious. And he begins to kind of think the same thing about her. Like, come on, man. And, you know, I, I, I get Frank. Frank moves fast with her. And I've been accused of moving too fast with women. And uh, the reason, I know the reason is because you don't know if you'll ever meet anyone that precious again. It used to be, in my mind, I don't know if I'll meet anyone again, like another woman ever, so I'd settle for some real horrible people. And then when I started sparking with really extraordinary people that were good to me, you know, then it was like, oh my God, you know, I can't lose this person, you know. Uh, I mean, her, 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 her like will not come my way again. And I, I wrote that about two different girlfriends on Facebook and this motherfucker made fun of me um, and I'm like you know I'm sorry you can't fucking you know spice up your you know sub Cro-Magnon vocabulary with a little poetry a little bit of poetic flair uh, and he said well it's what you said about the last one so I mean it must be equally unimportant <laughs> oh my god yeah, I blocked him. He was going to vote for Biden anyway, so fuck him. After preaching to me for years about how left-wing he was, that's the, that's the problem. Not that he did that, but just hypocrisy. Um, so yeah, uh, Frank 
sees this with Jesse, and you find out why. And, you know, he starts becoming more aggressive about being with her. Now, he does this after he's confronted by this guy named Leo, played by Robert Brosky. Now, Leo is this fat, balding, old, sleazy guy. I mean, I'm sure in real life Robert Brosky's a stand-up, clean, you know, dude. Uh, but in this movie, he's really the embodiment of pure sleaze to me. Uh, and he's kind of, he likes Frank's skill. And like I said, he wants to manipulate Frank. See, Frank's good at something. He's good at heists. This is what's allowed him to survive and prosper, even though he's had many setbacks, obviously, going to prison, etc. Um, Leo wants to exploit him, and it's obvious Leo wants to exploit him, but Frank has that... Frank at first is totally cynical about Leo, but I think Frank has that need to... Again, he didn't grow up with a family. Um, he has this idea for his life. And if he makes this deal with Leo to do this kind of, almost like a contract, for X amount of heist and X amount of who gets what and how it's run. Um, it's a too good to be true scenario. Uh, and if it's a too good to be true scenario, it's not true usually. Um, so Frank takes a big chance and we, the audience go, Fuck, man, why are you hooking up with Leah? You've been so fiercely individualistic and forged your own way and are, are living a semi-legitimate life. And you've got these emotional connections like your dying friend, and possibly something blossoming with this, you know, flaky woman uh, who comes in and out of his life who thinks he's flaky. Um, but he does it. The reason he does it is because he believes the stability and infrastructure of this deal will allow him to make that that mosaic that he's created come true. Um, I want to read something from Wikipedia, and then I want to give my own spin on this. Um, James Kahn's emotional seven-minute monologue, The Tuesday Well in a Coffee Shop, is often cited as the film's high point, and Kahn has long considered the scene his favorite of his career. Uh, so, yeah, let's touch on this. So, what he does is He's got this thing he carries in his wallet. It's like this folded up uh, piece of paper. It's like kind of, it's kind of like slick paper. And, and he's made a collage. And so he's got like, you know, things that represent home and security, uh, symbolic things. Uh, but he has people. He has Okla, his mentor. He's like, here's, you know, she knows Okla by now. I can't remember if Okla's died by this time or not. But he's like, here's Okla, you know, and that makes sense. He shows it to her. He doesn't show this to anyone. It, it's like, it's amazing. And then there's this, there's this blank spot. And, uh, and he said, then it's all leading here, like a home, maybe a family, and then here. And he's like, and here's where you would be. And um, she's about to cry too, man. And, uh, you know, he basically says, hey, you know, I, I want to make this happen. So you have a guy who grew up in a criminal and delinquent environment. Obviously has 
manual skills and he's cunning as a, as a criminal, but he also has a deep soul. He also has a deep yearning and he is in his own way creative. He is in his own way magical. I mean, that is an act of magic to create this mosaic, create these symbols and like meditate upon them and try to attain them one by one, putting the energy into that. And then you get to the zenith of this. So he's casting a spell. I mean, I know this sounds crazy to a lot of people. I don't care. Um, he's making manifest his deepest desire, and that is magic with a K. And, I mean, I've studied magic. I'm not a witch like my ex-fiance or a lot of people I know. Uh, but I, I have performed rituals. I understand what it is. I get it. I write about it. My characters, many of my characters were sorcerers or similar beings. And, you know, Aleister Crowley said magic is, you know, I'm very paraphrasing, affecting reality uh, in accordance with your own will. So you are literally making things happen, or the word that is used the most, manifesting, conjuring. And uh, I read a lot of Genesis P. Orridge. He was, he was a ritual magician in addition to being a, a musician and everything else and a writer. Grant Morrison was a ritual magician, so was Alan Moore. These people are making manifest through their art, and look at how all of them have shaped the culture. I mean, it's taken decades, but all three of those guys, their stuff has risen to the top of the mainstream where it's seen and heard, um, and it's affected people. Um, so my point is, is that Frank seems like a may seem like a banal, uh, jaded hero, anti-hero, uh, but he's more. His mistake, though, is temptation. He wants this so hard that he goes along with Leo, and things begin to go bad. Things begin to unravel. Leo offers him the chance to adopt a child after he's turned down by an adoption. So that's another powerful scene when he and Jesse go there and he's like, look, lady, I've been in the system since I was 12 and, and you know, I don't care. Give me a black kid, an Asian kid, a disabled kid. I mean, you know, somebody like I was, you know, and, and his heart's breaking all over again. It's like he's seeing their kids out there like he was and he wants to save one of them. Um, sorry, it's, it's a pretty emotional movie for me. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and then I hear this voice, don't be sorry for how you feel. Um, 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 um sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Leo arranges for them to adopt this kid. I think it is the Asian kid, if I'm correct. The black market. I mean, it's just so sleazy. You know, it's kind of like the, the thing that happened in uh, Eastern Promises, except that was even worse because the kid was actually the kid of the head mobster, Armin Mueller style. He had raped this teenage girl. Um, and they're like trying to sell this kid, you know. Um, yeah, the black market baby thing is pretty disgusting um uh but in this movie i think frank feels he has no alternative he's not going to let go of that part of his dream of jesse wanting a child and i i can't for, i can't remember i think jesse can't have a child could be frank one of them is barren however you want to put it so it happens, and he gets a new house, and he's rich, and he's partying with his buddy, Barry. Name, I want to get these facts right here. Uh, let's look at the cast. Barry. 
played by James Belushi, an early Jim Belushi role, a dramatic role, and he's fantastic. I think he's a great dramatic actor, personally. Very underrated. Very underrated. Um, so things go sour with Leo, and they, they, they capture Barry, they torture Barry, they gruesomely kill Barry. I mean, it's basically because Frank wants out. He's like, okay, no, I don't want this anymore. I'm going to leave all of you, you know. And so they corral Frank and they beat Frank and Leo tells him, you know, you, your house, your wife, your kid, all of this, it, it belongs to me. I made it happen. I own you, motherfucker. And that's the kind of being, I don't even want to say person or human, uh, that's the kind of being Leo is. And it brings in me when I watch it, it, it's like Frank now derails. You know, it's like his family is important. Getting out is the most important ultimate goal. But he has to destroy. He has to. I mean, and that's the arc of a lot of these kind of movies is that's all the hero or anti-hero is left with. You know, I must destroy those who wronged me have to it's a karmic uh, debt it's a you know it's it's fate it's 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 a, like a sentence a life death sentence i don't want to say a curse albatross it's something that is hung around their neck and on their shoulders that, that they're not really trying that hard to push away it, it's something they assume uh on a deep moral level um that drives a lot of action movies and revenge movies, and I can name a ton of them. And you, you need to understand what I'm talking about, of course. It's like, look at Heat, also by Michael Mann. Brilliant film. Haven't reviewed it on here. Have the Blu-ray. Nice Blu-ray. Deluxe. Robert De Niro as Neil McCauley, which is my favorite Robert De Niro role ever. Almost has every. He almost gets away with the woman, Amy Brenneman, who is so sweet, uh, playing like a Carolinian, a Southern artist who went to Parsons School of Art and Design. I mean, I knew people who, I, I live in North Carolina, I was raised here. I know people who went to Parsons. Uh, I'm probably Amy Brenneman's generation. And she had this great Southern accent. It was very comforting, very familiar. Uh, and she was kind. And Neil had not experienced this maybe ever, at least in a while. And uh, he wanted that to be his goal. He didn't have a map or a mosaic, but this was like, I'm going to do the last score and then I'm getting the fuck out. Well, last score gets very violent, of course, and there's a shootout in the streets of LA it's it's incredible but Neil does get away and he does tell um I forgot her name but character played by Amy Brenneman he does tell her the truth and you know a lot of people would think she's weak and abused and it's not politically correct but god damn it it's a story, it's conflict, it's romance, it's passion. You know, that, that's what it's supposed to be. And she says, okay, I'll go with you. And they, they're they going. They're evading the cops and everything uh, while Tom Sizemore's been killed. And, you know, uh, Mal Kilmer's almost uh, captured. Um, also of the gang and... He's like, I gotta stop. Because he finds out this guy who fucked him over in the very beginning of the movie, Wayne Grow, <laughs> the sleazebag serial killer of prostitutes, misanthrope. Uh, he's like, basically, it's like, I gotta kill Wayne Grow. You know, that's, he doesn't come out and say that all the time, like, I gotta kill Wayne Grow. But it's like, that's it. That's his loose end. That's what started a cycle 
uh, that led to the death of his friends, that led to all these fuck ups in his mind. He's partially correct, but not completely, you know. But you know, he kills this character Van Zant, who was part of that too. Uh, and then you know, he finds out where Wayne Grow is. I think he finds out from his mentor, played by John Boy, who's great in this movie, and. He stops the hotel. He's like, yeah, I'll be back in a few minutes. And she's waiting on him. And he goes and kills Wayne Grove. You know, unfortunately, then Al Pacino is on to him and he has to run. And she's in the car the whole time. And she starts seeing police storming away around. And she knows he, he ain't coming back to her. Um, so he could have had that. So what I'm saying is, is Frank is at this juncture point in the very last portion of Thief. <sighs> Basically, he kicks out Jesse. He's very mean to her because he wants to force her to leave, but it's for her own good. He wants her and the kid not to be killed. And they have an assistant. I can't remember the guy's name, but he does all their shit for them. That guy is going to get her and the kid set up some other state some other country maybe i think and um he gives her a lot of money um and it's like i'm not gonna let anything happen to my family you know i'm not gonna be part of it anymore but this is something i built and created and manifested i'm not gonna let it be destroyed even if i have to be wrenched from it and so that's out of the way. And then, of course, to be free, he's free in his mind. In his mind, he doesn't, he's the, Leo doesn't own him. He doesn't belong to Leo. So the last driving, uh, you know, the last engine that's driving uh, Frank forward uh, is destroying Leo and because this guy's crossed the line which we saw early in the movie Frank has this line and he's good at it he's very solid he's very defiant he's very strong willed because he grew up being bullied and alone and I will say from growing a bullied and alone I'm not like Frank but I see that I feel it when he in other words, you do learn to have that armor and when to cut people off and be cruel. Even when you don't want to have to develop that skill, you kind of have to. It's a survival strategy. It, it, it's something that's unavoidable. And some people have told me they don't like that about me. Some people have told me they have great respect for me about it. Personally, it's one of my favorite things about myself. That I'm finally able to be me, be strong and be free in my mind and be defiant of things that I know are morally wrong, things that I know are infringing on me and my boundaries. So then that's it, Frank, you know, violence, that's it, man. It's uh, eye for an eye and, you know, they killed Barry and um, gets into Leo's house and he finally blows Leo away, but the henchmen are still alive, especially this clown played by Dennis Farina, who, you know, started his acting career, I think maybe with this movie. He was a cop, if I'm correct. And then he's in quite a few, he's in a lot of Michael Mann movies. I mean, he's in, is he in Heat? He's in uh, Manhunter, obviously. Uh, doesn't he play Jack Crawford, I believe. Um, He's got some kind of fancy gun, like a rocket launcher or something. But Frank, man, Frank does get shot, I think, in the leg. But he does manage to kill all of them. Now, mind you, he set his own house on fire. He has set his own house on fire. Like, everything. So, the cord is severed. So, he's not going to have what's in this mosaic that he created. It's not 
it manifested and now it's fractured, you know, and then the pieces have come apart, you know, never to be, you know, reunited. And after he kills the three guys, you know, they had shot at him, and, and then you find out he has a bulletproof vest, which, which I think they kind of visually hint at earlier, that he's going to go into this wearing that. And he's a professional, you know. So he's taking off the bulletproof vest, and he's he's basically just walking away from this house, just down the street, while this incredible music of Tangerine Dream and a guitar solo by somebody, I don't know who, there's a guy who collaborates with Dream on this, forgot his name. Let me see what his name is. It might not be that important, uh, but it's important to me. Uh, music composed by Greg Safan, additional music. So that could be him. It's very it's very 80s, but in a good way. I mean, it's just it's, a, it's an emotional guitar solo, and it kind of echoes as he kind of walks down the street into the night. To where? You know? I mean, this is like pure existentialism. What What is he going to do? It's like the kind of character who I keep fucking up, keep doing bad things, I don't deserve good things. So now I'm really fucked up. Somebody fucks me up. And I try to correct it. And it gets even worse. So I give up. Because I don't deserve to be happy. I don't deserve uh, to have a good life. Because I come from, you know, violence and pain and loneliness and abuse and uncertainty. Um, and I feel as though uh, that's where he's at. There's a lot of characters I've followed, and there are characters I've written uh, who follow the same arc emotionally. And it's sad because they're they're setting a self-fulfilling prophecy for themselves. I've almost become that person on more than one occasion. It'd be easy for me too right now, certainly what's going on in my life, but I'm fighting it, man. Fighting it. Um, so I want to thank you guys for listening. If you have, <laughs> please drop a like, please subscribe. Uh, you guys are helping me a lot. And as you guys help me and I feel that energy, the content's going to get stronger because I'm going to want to do to say something of relevance, even if it's about some fucking, you know, half ass B movie, you know, I mean, I might, I might, you know, I might sit down and psychoanalyze blood shack by raiding a steckler for an hour. No, hell no, I'm not going to do that, but you know what I'm saying? I hope you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? And, um, this tells it to you is calm. That's really good. I drink this right out of the bottle at my work at the register. I really like my job. I hate the fact I have to go there in pain. I'm not in pain now. I'm just kidding. So, you know, with, with some drugs coursing through my mind, brain, my body, first thing I decided to do when I come home was, was do this. I asked uh, my, my great, great, great friend and mentor, many years Tim McLean if you thought that was a good idea to do this off the cuff a little tribute to, to Khan and, and talk with Thief and he said oh man you haven't covered Thief yet yeah sounds like a great idea let me just talk about this for a minute this is the Criterion Edition can you see that this is the Criterion Edition of Thief it's really dark um see James Khan no, that's Frank anyway that cover. Let my lighting, you know, I, I could turn up the lighting a little bit. Woo! Okay. So, yeah, so there's Thief. Uh, this is a one disc set. 
you see these sparks. That's him with the uh, acetylene torch doing his uh, best to crack a safe. Nice booklet. And, and one thing, <laughs> and the title of this essay is "Where Nothing Means Where Nothing Means Nothing." Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Um, it, it's great. I mean, director approved edition, uh, 4K restoration, digital restoration, uh, director's cut supervised by Michael Mann, uh, 5.1 surround DTS HD, Pioneer audio soundtrack. Uh, audio commentary featuring man and actor James Kahn. Uh, new interviews with man, Kahn, Johannes Schmoling of the band and Dream Dream. Uh, trailer plus an essay by critic Mick James, which I just read the title of. Uh, for a Criterion Pact edition, it's a little light, but for any other blu-ray release it's it's packed and it's beautiful it looks incredible i mean you expect my see i hate this glare i you know you expect michael mann's stuff to look amazing now this little blue glare you know it is kind of annoying but it's actually kind of fitting because that seems to be man's favorite color is this monochromatic kind of blue thing kind of like you see in a lot of hong kong cinema of the of the 80s and 90s albeit in those movies it's more diffuse lighting and fuzzy and muted uh, man's is clear and electric you know so all right man thank you for everything uh i'll shout out to my patrons and all this other stuff down below uh, help me out if you can i'm in dire straits i could lose my house and my health is kind of shitty but i'm persevering uh, if you want to be a patron, please do. If you want to contribute funds to keep me going, please do. If you can't, and I understand, uh, the, the, this things are things are fucked up for all of us right now. I love you guys. Watch Thief by Michael Mann as soon as you possibly can. Okay.